Welcome to Inhibition. Today's topic, the Second Amendment. Was it just for muskets? Do you have to be in a militia? It's time we talk about it. All right, welcome to Inhibition. Thank you for coming to the channel. This is our first video on this channel. And so before we jump into the topic of the Second Amendment, I wanted to go ahead and point out that the word inhibition simply means an inward impediment to free expression. Politics and religion are something that many people say you're not supposed to talk about. This channel is all about breaking down that wall. We're going to talk about politics and religion. We're going to talk about political topics, religious topics, and we're going to break down that inward impediment that keeps us from freely expressing what we believe in politics and religion. And so that's what this channel is. Thank you for joining us. We're going to go ahead and jump into the topic, the Second Amendment. What does the Second Amendment say and why are we talking about it? We're talking about it because there's actually an upcoming Supreme Court case on the Second Amendment. This is the first major gun rights case that the Supreme Court has heard in over a decade. The last major case being in 2008 and then expanded in 2010 and then nothing since. This is related specifically to New York and their concealed carry. There's many stipulations that they have. You have to jump through hoops to be able to get to concealed carry. There's so many impediments in the way that it's almost impossible. And that's what this case is really about. Now, this video is not going to be about the case itself. We'll do another video in the future covering that case. But today, we're just going to talk about the Second Amendment itself, what's in it, and some major arguments that we hear people argue about the Second Amendment. A lot of people are so void of knowledge on the Second Amendment and understanding of it that like these people on the screen, they're calling for the repeal of the Second Amendment. So they'll argue that the goal should be to repeal the Second Amendment, that it's outdated, that people don't even you know need the Second Amendment anymore, that we need to seriously consider repealing it. So all of those people in those screenshots there, they are absolutely looking to repeal the Second Amendment. There's some people who defend it, but there's many people who want to repeal it. And it's because they do not understand it. And so hopefully this video will break it down. So what does the Second Amendment say? It says, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's it. That's the entirety of the Second Amendment. And so many people have argued about this small amendment and this small phrase for decades. So we're going to hopefully break down bring some clarity, break this down a little bit for you and get the full understanding of what this amendment was actually saying. Now there's four main arguments that we're going to talk about in this video. The first one is the concept of being well-regulated. The amendment itself says that a well-regulated militia, regulated, people argue means government regulation. They say gun control is built right into the second amendment. And we're going to talk about that. It talks about a well-regulated militia. So people argue that you have to join a militia, that this was not a right for individuals, but for only people who had joined a militia. We'll talk about that. It also talks about muskets versus ARs. A lot of people argue that at the time the Second Amendment was written, the only gun that they had at that time was muzzle loaders, single shot, muskets. And so that's what the Second Amendment was written about. And they could have no idea when they wrote it that an AR-15 would exist and therefore it should not apply to AR-15s, basically arguing that it's outdated. And then finally, the last argument that there are limitations on all of our rights. For example, free speech, you can't yell fire in at the crowded theater. So there should be limitations on the Second Amendment as well. We'll talk about that. So we're going to hit all four of these arguments in this video. We're going to start off with well-regulated and talk about what that actually means. Now, a lot of people tie this phrase to regulation. So for example, in this screenshot, there's a poll that somebody had done about should adults be allowed to carry handguns in public without licenses or permits? And you can see that somebody responded and said, that doesn't sound well-regulated to me. As if the phrase well-regulated must be talking about government regulation, in this case, about permits 
to carry guns. Or about these examples. So over here on the right, for the zillionth time, the Second Amendment reads, starts out with the phrase, a well-regulated militia. When do we start to see the regulation? Or the person who says, when gun nuts start crying about confiscation, they're just parroting the NRA party line. Disgusting. They'd rather throw the baby out with the bathwater than see real gun regulation, as in the whole well-regulated militia business. And finally, the Second Amendment actually does permit the regulation of arms. It's in the opening phrase, which the NRA conveniently edited out, a well-regulated militia. So again, tying the phrase well-regulated to government regulation. These are just some people on Twitter, but I want to show you a video clip of some other people making this claim. The NRA yesterday tweeted an image of the Constitution and then several hours later retweeted again, noting a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Regulated means controlled. Well means thorough. Gun control is in the Constitution, but American gun manufacturers have successfully hammered the right to bear arms part, but not the well-regulated part. You give enough people in this country unlimited access to this kind of high weaponry, and what are they going to do? Yes, some mentally deranged people are going to abuse that. That's why you need regulation. It doesn't mean we take your guns away, but what it does mean is that we can be sane about this, that not everybody has the right to, it says right to bear arms. What, so then you could put a rocket propelled grade, a grenade, an RPG on your shoulder, walk around, uh, open carry, open carry, you right to bear arms. What part of your ass is part of a well-regulated militia? This is nonsense. All right, look, to give you a better sense of it, this is what they said back in 1777 in the journals of the Conti uh, Continental Congress. Resolved that this appointment be conferred on experienced and vigilant general officers who are acquainted with whatever relates to the general economy, maneuvers, and discipline of a well-regulated army. I give you that quote to give you a sense of what they meant by well-regulated. It meant a disciplined force that you could call upon, bring a quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. You ignore the first part because it is convenient for you. Because you want to have your guns, the gun manufacturers want to sell more guns, the NRA wants to make more money and buy more politicians. You are not part of a well-regulated militia. This is nonsense. You do not have an unlimited right to keep and bear arms. So as you can see, people argue that regulated means control. It's gun control is built right into the Second Amendment. As Chank Yuger from the Young Turks there argued that you have to be part of a well-regulated militia and don't have an unlimited right to bear arms, that there needs to be regulation. That phrase, well-regulated, we need to break down what that actually means and what it's talking about because so many people abuse that phrase. First of all, this phrase, well-regulated, what is it even talking? about in context to the passage that it's written in in the second amendment what does it actually even say is it saying that the arms themselves the guns the firearms themselves should be well regulated well no the second amendment doesn't say well regulated arms so it's not talking about the guns themselves being regulated what about the people well regulated people does it say that well nope not talking about the people either what about the right of the people right the right itself needs to be well regulated well no it doesn't say a well regulated right so what is it talking about when it says well regulated that is referring to the militia now that's important it's referring to the militia well regulated was not talking about the firearms or the people or the right of the people it was talking about the militia so what did well regulated actually mean what does that phrase actually mean well we can gain insight from this by looking at the way it was used in that day the oxford english 
English Dictionary in 1709 said, If a liberal education has formed in us well-regulated appetites and worthy inclinations. Well-regulated appetites there didn't mean rules or government regulation or control, as the gentleman in the video we watched a second ago said. Instead, it simply means properly functioning. Properly functioning appetites should want worthy inclinations, worthy, good things. The idea is that if you had a good education, it should produce in you a properly functioning appetite for good things. In 1812, we see the equation of time is the adjustment of the difference of time as shown by a well-regulated clock and a true sundial. Well-regulated clock there is not government regulated clock. It is a properly functioning clock, a clock that is working according to its proper order. That's a well-regulated clock. In 1848, it talks about a well-regulated person will blame the mayor. Well-regulated there isn't a government controlled person or a person with government regulation. A well-regulated person was simply a person properly functioning. A properly functioning person will blame the mayor in this instance. In 1862, talks about it appearing to her well-regulated mind like a clandestine proceeding. Well-regulated mind is not the mind that's under the control of the government. It's not government regulation. It's just a properly functioning mind. It appeared to her properly functioning mind, a, a mind that's in proper working order like a clandestine proceeding. And then you can see in 1894, it talks about every well-regulated American embryo city, embryo being new, newly formed. So every American newly formed city, if it was well-regulated or properly functioning, the newspaper was a key part of the city. And so we can see from these uses that well-regulated meant in proper working order, properly functioning, in proper working order. A militia that's in proper working order is a militia filled with people that know their weapons and are familiar with them and their use. I can't properly function as a militia without knowing my weapon. And so it is a group of people in the militia who are properly functioning because they know their weapon and are familiar with the use of them. We can see this in quotes from the founding fathers about how this would happen. Alexander Hamilton says, if circumstances should at any time oblige the government to form any army of any any magnitude, that army can never be formidable to the liberties of the people while there is a large body of citizens, little if at all inferior to them in discipline and the use of arms, who stand ready to defend their rights and those of their fellow citizens. In other words, Hamilton is saying it doesn't matter how big of an army the government creates, it doesn't matter how strong and how trained that military is, if the large body of the people, if the citizens themselves are familiar with their guns, they will be be able to stand up against government tyranny, which was the point of the militia. So he's saying that the people being familiar with their guns because they've used them and they've gotten familiar with them, they would be able to stand against an army. We see Thomas Jefferson in a letter he wrote in 1778 during the Revolutionary War where he was explaining about the numbers of people wounded and in killed or even taken captive during that time. In the last half of this quote, it says, I think that upon the whole, it has been what about one half the number of those lost by them in some instances more but in others less the difference is, is ascribed to our superiority in taking aim when we fire every soldier in our army having been intimate with his gun from his infancy in other words jefferson is saying that we had superiority when we went to fight the enemy why because every soldier in our army every soldier fighting this war right now they grew up with their guns they were familiar with them from the time they were young because the citizens had guns privately, they were so familiar with them that it made them more superior when they fought. That is how the militia becomes well regulated. It wasn't about government regulation and rules. It was about being familiar and capable with your firearm. That's what well regulated means. Not government rules, not regulations, not government control, not gun control. It was about being familiar and capable with your firearm. Well, great, I'm glad you asked that, because I have read it, and I'm pretty convinced you haven't. So let me show it to you. Quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Do you understand that the first part of the sentence is what you call a qualifier? Not, you know, they could have just written the sentence, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, period. Right? But they didn't write it that way. They put a qualifier in the beginning. They said, a well-regulated militia being necessary 
to the security of a free state, hence you get the arms. If you're using it as part of a well-regulated militia. It meant because the, United, the, the new United States would have no standing army that any armed defense of the states or the United States would depend on militia who would be mobilized to fight the fights they needed to fight. So there's that. It means that the states have the right to have a well-regulated militia. And a 20-year-old kid carrying a, an assault weapon on the streets of downtown America has absolutely nothing to do with a well-regulated militia. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Militia is the key part that is often left out. For the vast majority of U.S. history, courts viewed the Second Amendment as being specifically tied to militia. Now, this argument about needing to be in the militia ties right in with well-regulated. We already saw under well-regulated that the idea of being well-regulated was being so familiar with your arms that the individual would be familiar with their arms from the time they were young. But is it tied to service in the militia? Is that what it is tied to? We saw from the Young Turks there that they argued that that first phrase, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state is a qualifier that you have to have service in the militia in order to get the arms in order to get the right to keep and bear arms is that actually what this is is this a qualifier well the answer is no this is a prefatory clause prefatory clause is not a qualifier prefatory simply means of or relating to or constituting a preface a preface is just an introductory remark of the speaker or author. In other words, when they wrote the Second Amendment, that first phrase, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, is just an introduction. It is not a qualifier. It's not saying you must do this in order to do this. The qualifying language is not listed anywhere in the Second Amendment. It doesn't say a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, as long as you join the militia, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It doesn't say that. That is a misinterpretation of what the text actually says. It doesn't say anything about being a qualifier. This is just an introduction. From there, we get the second phrase. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This is what's known as the operative clause. Operative simply means the most significant or essential part. So you've got the prefatory phrase, the introduction, saying that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. And then you've got the operative cause, which is the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Notice it says the right of the people, not the right of the militia, but the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's the operative clause. Now, this is not something I just made up. This actually comes straight from the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in 2008 and D.C. v. Heller said that the Second Amendment is naturally divided into two parts, its prefatory clause and its operative clause. The former does not limit the latter grammatically, but rather announces a purpose. The amendment could be rephrased because a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In other words, that prefatory clause, it is not a qualifier. It's not saying you must be in the militia in order to get the right. It is saying that it is a purpose. It is a reason. It is saying that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Why? Because, and it gives a reason, a well-regulated militia is necessary for the security of a free state. And we already saw why they would link these two because an in individual right to bear arms prepares the people, the body of the people, the citizenry, and if they ever needed to fight against government tyranny, they would have the skills necessary to be well regulated. That's the point. That is the Second Amendment. Basically, D.C. v. Heller established that the Second Amendment protected the right to keep and bear arms unconnected with service in the militia. Service in the militia was just a reason it was not the only reason, but it was just a reason, the most important reason, why individuals should have a right to keep and bear arms. Thomas Jefferson, again, affirmed the individual right to bear arms. He said in the draft of the Virginia Constitution, he said, No free man shall ever be debarred the use of arms. No, It's not no free man in a militia, just no free man in general shall ever be debarred the use of arms. 
He also said this, and this is a very important quote in his book, Commonplace. He wrote, Laws that forbid the carrying of arms disarm only those who are neither inclined nor determined to commit crimes. Such laws make things worse for the assaulted and better for the assailants. They serve rather to encourage than to prevent homicides, for an unarmed man may be attacked with greater confidence than an armed man. Jefferson affirmed the individual right to self-defense and the individual right to bear arms, and he did it in context to personal defense, not the militia. In other words, the militia was not the only reason people should be able to bear arms. It was the supreme reason, which is why it's written in the Second Amendment, but it is not the only reason. Jefferson affirmed it's for personal defense as well. So no, the Second Amendment did not say you could only have arms if you were in a militia. We can see this with other founding fathers. George Mason wrote this in a declaration that he wrote that was adopted by the Virginia Ratification Convention. He said that the people have a right to keep and bear arms, the people, that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people, the militia being composed of all the people, trained to arms is the proper natural and safe defense of a free state. In other words, it is the body of the people, it is the citizenry that composes up the militia and it is them who need to be well armed. Then he goes on to say in the U.S. Constitution Ratification Convention for Virginia, in 1788, George Mason said, when the resolution of enslaving America was formed in Great Britain, the British Parliament was advised by an artful man who was governor of Pennsylvania to disarm the people that is the best and most effectual way to enslave them, but that they should not do it openly, but weaken them and let them sink gradually. I ask... Who are the militia? They consist now of the whole people, except a few public officers. George Mason explained that the militia was the people. It isn't some organized government group. It is the whole people. It's the entire citizenry, the people. Some people think, well, the founding fathers, they didn't mean, you know, it's not the whole people. Now we have the National Guard, right? So so that we they didn't have that back then. So even though he said it's the whole people, it's not really the whole people today. But that's actually not true. In U.S. law, currently, in 2021, this is in federal U.S. law. It says, subsection A, the militia of the United States consist of all able-bodied males at least 17 years of age and except as provided in section 313 of title 32 under 45 years of age who are or who have made a declaration of intention to become citizens of the united states so if you're 17 to 45 and you are an able-bodied male by u.s law you are by definition in the militia notice it doesn't say you have to be in the national guard it says you are in the militia at that age if you're able-bodied male then it does go on to say and of female citizens of the united states who are members of the national guard so all able-bodied males 17 to 45 and then if you're a female who is in the national guard you're included as well some people try to argue well that phrase who are members of the national guard it doesn't just mean the females that's talking about the males too it's just kind of worded weird that's actually not true if you look in subsection b that proves that wrong subsection b says the classes of the militia are the organized militia which consists of the national guard and the naval militia and the unorganized militia which consists of the members of the militia who are not members of the national guard or the naval militia so it's not just the Mil national guard that is the militia people who argue that well the national guard is the militia today they're only a part of the militia today there is an unorganized militia that the u.s law in america still shows that is the people it is the citizens the militia is the people there is an individual right to keep and bear arms that leads us into our third argument about the second amendment and that's muskets People say, but it was only about muskets. Okay, you have an individual right to keep and bear arms, but it only applies to muskets because that's the only gun that they really had back then. They had muzzle loaders, single shot weapons. That's what they used. That's what the Second Amendment was talking about. They had no idea, nor could they ever imagine something like an AR-15. So clearly the Second Amendment wasn't talking about that. It's outdated and it was only talking about muskets. Here are some people making that argument. Excuse me. Hey! Hey! So if you want to just add those in, we can send them out. That's okay.
Republicans like to pretend that their interpretations of the Constitution are based on the original intent of the words. They insist that what matters is what the authors of those words had in mind. They think of themselves as mind readers of the Founding Fathers. Well, this is what they had in mind when they wrote the Second Amendment, a single shot firearm that takes a bit of work to reload. I'm, I'm a firm believer in the Second Amendment. In fact, I consider myself to be a Second Amendment originalist. That means I believe every man or woman has the right to bear arms, but only the, the same arms that our country's forefathers bore in the 18th century. Muskets. I'm talking black powder, muzzle-loaded, smoothbore guns fashioned with a bayonet. So the argument goes that because muskets is all they had, then that must have been what they were talking about. And therefore, that's what the Second Amendment was about. And they had no idea that technology would advance. There's a bunch of problems with this argument that we'll get to. But one of the biggest issues is that you wouldn't apply this logic to any other of your First Amendment, Second Amendment, Third Amendment, Fourth Amendment, any of those rights. You wouldn't apply this to those rights. So, for example, your First Amendment right has a right right to freedom of the press. Now, TV channels and cameras like we have now and cable news, none of those things existed at the time of the First Amendment and the Founding Fathers could have never imagined that those things would be created. So clearly freedom of the press only applied to the printing press, right? And not this modern technology. Or what about religion, freedom of religion? There are new religions being created all the time. Mormonism, for example, wasn't created at the time of the First Amendment. So I guess that's not covered under your freedom of religion. Or what about freedom of speech with new technology? For example, this YouTube video that you're watching right now. Or, or what about microphones or megaphones? Or do, do you lose your freedom of speech because of those things not being invented at the time of the First Amendment? What about your Fourth Amendment right against unreasonable search and seizure? Cars weren't invented at the time, so clearly that right doesn't apply to, to cars because the Founding Fathers would have never imagined a car being invented. Do you see the problem? You can't apply that logic across the board. So people want to use this argument for the Second Amendment, but then when you try to apply across the board, they'll be like, oh, no, wait, wait. And it's because their logic is flawed. On top of that, not only is the logic itself flawed, but the argument that they only had muskets is flawed. You have to assume that A, they couldn't imagine that technology would ever advance. Like what if guns become more dangerous? They, they That thought would have never crossed their mind. And that's simply not true. But aside from that, you have to ignore history, which most people don't actually know. They had weapons other than muskets. In 1590, that's 200 years before the Second Amendment was written. In 1590, there was a 16 shot wheel lock, which had an oval bore, 67 caliber rifle, and it was designed to fire 16 stacked charges of powder and ball in a rapid Roman candle fashion. 16 charges, rapid fashion. That's not a single shot musket. And this is 200 years before the Second Amendment. In 1650, there was a repeating flintlock rifle that was created. And it was actually used in combat in Copenhagen in 1659. And then in 1675, that's 132 years and 116 years before the Second Amendment was ever ratified in 1791. And the reason this is so significant is because it had a high capacity magazine. High capacity firearms, they're not a new concept. This particular rifle had magazines that could hold up to 30 rounds. Hey, guess what an AR-15 holds? High capacity magazines are not a new thing. In 1750, there was a repeating flintlock rifle that was created. It's a lever action breech loading repeater. Now the mechanism that was used on this was actually dating back to 1680 and was used in Europe, for, named after an Italian gunsmith. And long arms that were using that system from Europe were being created in the United States in 18, until about 1849. It was being used. They knew about this gun. This particular rifle dates from about 1750, and it featured two chamber horizontally mounted rotating drums. And after firing the rifle, the cycling process could be repeated until the two magazines with their seven shot capacities were empty. That's 14 rounds without having to reload. This wasn't a single shot rifle that had to be reloaded in between each shot. And this was created, the system was created over a hundred years before the second amendment. And this was this particular rifle 
was in 1750, which was decades before the Second Amendment. And then it gets even more. In 1777, there was the Belton Rapidan Flintlock. This rifle had a 16 to 20 round capacity and could shoot 30 to 60 rounds per minute. Then you had the Puckle Gun. This is in 1718. This is the predecessor of modern machine guns. It had 11 round preloaded cylinders and sought, shot 63 shots in seven minutes. A lot more than the single shot muskets. And then people tend to forget about cannon. Cannons had up to 1,000 yard distance and could shoot three to six pound rounds. Cannonballs, three to six pounds. A cannon could do more damage than an AR-15 could do today. And the founding fathers wrote in papers arguing that people had a right to own private cannons because of the Second Amendment. So no, they didn't just have muskets. That is completely a lie, and most people who say it just have no knowledge. They've done no research and don't even know these guns exist. The Founding Fathers knew that gun technology was advancing, and yet they chose not to limit the Second Amendment to muskets only, but they purposely used the word arms. They could have said, the right of the people to keep and bear muskets shall not be infringed, but they chose not to. They chose to use the word arms, knowing that technology had already advanced in weaponry in their lifetime to some very high-powered weapons there was no reason for them to think that guns would not continue to advance and yet they still use the word arms so no this was not just about muskets and that leads us to our last argument that we're going to look at in this video and all rights have limits right our first amendment right has a limit free speech you can't yell fire in a crowded theater that's a common argument so if the argument goes that if our first amendment right to free speech has limits it only makes sense to have limits to our second amendment as well why would you argue that you can't have limits here's some people making that exact argument but no amendment no amendment to the constitution is absolute you can't yell crowd you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater we call it freedom of speech from the very beginning you couldn't own any weapon you wanted to own from the very beginning of the Second Amendment existed, certain people weren't allowed to have weapons. Do you have a right to bear any arms? I mean, for example, in California, you can't have nunchucks. There are all sorts of uh, mm -hmm. things. You, you can't have a cannon. You right. can't have all sorts of all weapons sorts of you things. cannot have. So it's not absolute, um, just the way the First Amendment is an absolute. If you uh, scream fire in a crowded movie theater, that's not protected speech. I believe in the Second Amendment, it's there written on the paper. I taught constitutional law. I know a little bit about this. <laughs> I, I get it. But I also believe that we can find ways to reduce gun violence consistent with the Second Amendment. I mean, think about it. We all believe in the First Amendment, the guarantee of free speech, but we, ex we accept that you can't yell fire in a theater. We understand there are some constraints on our freedom. So there are some constraints on our freedom. Now this is a very important point. Yes, there are limitations on our rights. No one is claiming that there should be no limits on any right at all. That is not what people are claiming. That, however, does not mean that every limitation that you decide to think up should be allowed. There is a principle that it should follow. And that is the principle of limitations. You can't use your right to infringe on other people's rights. This is why we can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Actually, in reality, you can yell fire in a crowded theater if there really is a fire. But if there's not a fire and you yell fire and you create a panic and people get up and stampede out, it creates the potential for injury and people not to be safe. Your right to freedom of speech does not take away someone else's right to safety and security. And therefore, that is why it is a limitation. The the principle of limitations basically says there's a line right here, your rights are on one side, my rights are on the other, and as long as my rights stay on my side and I do not cross the line into infringing upon your rights, then there is no limit. That's the principle of limitations. It is not that you just get to make up whatever limitation you want anytime you want. And the thing is we actually already have limitations on our Second Amendment rights. 
For example, I can't use my Second Amendment right to go murder, injure, or threaten someone. I can't take my gun and say, I have a right to this gun to carry it around so I get to shoot you with it. That's not allowed. And the reason why is because I cannot use my right to keep and bear arms to infringe upon your right to life. We already have these limits in place, just like we already have the limit that you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Now, you might be saying, well, it's obviously got to be more than just murder and injure and threaten, right? We got to have other limits, and there are other limits. For example, nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. People will try to make the argument, well, if you think people should be able to have an AR-15 and and you shouldn't be able to limit that, then do you think people should be able to have a nuclear weapon? That argument is so funny to me because people who make that argument, they're trying to compare an AR-15 to a nuclear weapon as if those are any way comparable, and they're not, and it's actually a very funny argument, usually made by people who know nothing about an AR-15. But ultimately, nuclear weapons... The reason we can't have those isn't just because somebody decided, hey, I don't want somebody to have that. It is because a nuclear weapon cannot be used defensively. I cannot fire a nuclear weapon without injuring, killing innocent people. Innocent people will die if I use a nuclear weapon. That means that I would be using my right to arms to injure or kill innocent people, which is taking away their right to life when they did nothing to sacrifice their rights. It is an infringement. That falls under the principle of limitation, which is why we can't own nuclear weapons or ballistic missiles. Me owning an AR-15, however, does not have that same problem. I can use an AR-15 defensively to only attack or shoot the people defensively who are attacking me. It is not an infringement on your right for me to have an AR-15 or even to use an AR-15 as long as I use it without murdering or injuring or threatening, which are already limitations. So no, you should not be able to limit my right to have an AR-15. And you can apply that. You can talk about M-16s and, and other weapons as well. We need to get back to the principle of limitation People talk about common sense gun control. Common sense gun control is what I just said. Your rights cannot infringe upon my rights. That's common sense. Anything that falls within that principle of limitation is common sense. Anything that falls outside of that principle of limitation, it is simply an infringement. All rights do have limits, but not whatever limit you just want to make up on any given day. That brings us to the end of the video, and hopefully that helped you, gave you some information about the Second Amendment. If you're pro Second Amendment, I hope you got some things out of that that you can use in your conversations with others. And if you're someone who is pro gun control, I hope that some of this was eye opening. Either way, comment down below and let's have a discussion about it. Let's talk about the Second Amendment. Thanks so much for watching. For more videos, click subscribe and hit that notification bell. And if you enjoyed the video, click that like button. See you next time.